protectors, and warriors. Revelation 12 tells of a war in heaven in which Michael and his angelic army go head to head with Satan and his army. Seducers and shapeshifters. Medieval and ancient sources depict Lilith as a seducer who can turn into a vampire or a snake. From ancient texts to Hollywood movies, stories about these supernatural beings have captured our imagination. Movies such as Jin, Wishmaster, and Haunted all show Jin shapeshifting into animals, humans, or some demonic form. Stories about good and evil supernatural beings transcend religious texts and cultures. So what is it about them that draws us in? that keeps their stories going. And what do these stories about angels, demons, and jinn say about us? Ur, Mesopotamia, second millennium BCE. An old, childless man by the name of Abram, under the guidance of God, leaves his home to found a new nation. He is promised land, children, and a relationship with God. In honor of his unwavering obedience to God, his name is changed to Abraham. It's through Abraham and his descendants that three monotheistic faiths are born, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All three faiths acknowledge angels in their sacred texts. In the Tanakh, the Bible, and the Quran, angels are spiritual beings, messengers and followers of God who help humans and who can take human form. On the plain of Mamre, Abraham pitched his tent and sat while the day grew hot. Suddenly, he noticed three men standing near him. According to Rabbi Alan Lerner, Jewish tradition assigns names to these three men. Michael was sent to tell Abraham and Sarah they will have a son. Raphael was there to heal Abraham from his circumcision, and Gabriel was sent to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible's telling of the story doesn't veer far from the Tanakhs. The angels are messengers of God's promise and deliverers of God's judgment. However, Christians often interpret the passage differently than Jews do. Many Christians believe that one of the angels was not an angel at all, but rather an early appearance of Jesus. Others say that the three men were symbolic of the Trinity. The story of the angels appearing to Abraham does not differ much among the three religions. The Quran does not mention the number of angels present. It only says that our messengers appear to Abraham to deliver the news about Isaac's future birth. Just as in the Tanakh and the Bible, the Quran does not say which angels appeared, but Islamic tradition says that Michael and Gabriel were present. Gabriel is one of only two angels mentioned by name in the Tanakh. This significant angel is referenced in the book of Daniel as a holy being and at times a frightening man who helps Daniel interpret his vision about the end of days and the restoration and rebuilding of Jerusalem. The Christian Bible's Gabriel is also an interpreter of visions and a messenger of the Lord who foretells the future. In the Bible, Gabriel foretells the Messiah, who Christians say is Jesus, just like he foretells the anointed leader in the Tanakh. Gabriel not only prophesies the Messiah in Daniel, but in the Gospel of Luke, he predicts the birth of both John the Baptist, who prepared the way for Christ, as well as the birth of Jesus himself. Gabriel is often said to be the most important angel of the Islamic faith. He was the angel responsible for bringing the message of Allah to the Prophet Muhammad, and most of his appearances in the Quran reference him in this way. The Holy Book also mentions that the angel Gabriel is incredibly powerful and acted as a guardian for Muhammad. Most scholars agree that Gabriel is also the being that is referenced to in the Quran as the Holy Spirit. Unlike Gabriel, Michael is described as a prince. He is the second angel mentioned by name in the Tanakh, a fearless warrior devoted to the shielding of the Lord's people. This heavenly being appears in the book of Daniel where it stated that he helped the prophet Daniel and fought the mysterious king of Persia. As in the Tanakh, the Christian Bible's Michael is a figure of authority, specifically an archangel. He is a warrior and a protector of God's people. The Bible expands on the book of Daniel by identifying an enemy that Michael fights and protects against, the devil. Revelation 12 tells of a war in heaven in which Michael and his angelic army defeat Satan and his army. 
and in Jude, we learn that Michael and Satan argued about Moses' body. Michael is not nearly as significant in the Quran as Gabriel is. He is mentioned only once, and that verse only signifies that he is among the angels. However, there is a verse in the Quran that talks about a plural, we, that seems to be responsible for the forces of nature. And while the Quran does not actually say that this is Michael, many scholars believe that it is. While Gabriel and Michael are significant in their status and charges, they are not the only angels mentioned in these sacred texts. The Tanakh talks about mystical angels who surround God's throne. The cherubim appear in the book of Ezekiel and the first book of Samuel, where they are described as living creatures with four wings. These appear surrounded by blazing fire and have animal faces on the back of their human faces. Each has a lion face on the right, an ox on the left, and an eagle on the back. The seraphim appear in the book of Isaiah. They have six wings to cover their face, to their legs, and they use the other two to fly. The Christian Bible also includes the cherubim and seraphim. Beyond that, Revelation 4 talks about beings that surround God's throne, the four living creatures. Each is covered in eyes and looks like a lion, calf, man, or eagle. They have six wings, and they unceasingly praise God. Some Christians theorize that they are synonymous with seraphim or the living beings in Ezekiel 1, while others say that they are an entirely different type of angel. The Quran also speaks of special beings who carry the throne of Allah. They are known as the Hamalat Alarsh, and they appear several times in the Quran. In addition to bearing the throne of Allah, these beings also have the task of praying for those who have repented. Some hadith, which are scriptural texts outside of the Quran, suggest that they have the same four faces that the Jewish and Christian seraphim do. Along with warrior angels, messenger angels, and angels of the throne, there are other unnamed angels that perform a very important role, that of guardian. Though the term guardian is not used to describe angels in the Tanakh, they are still shown to safeguard and guide individuals whenever they need it the most. A very nice example is found in Daniel 10, where an angel says to him in a vision, Have no fear, Daniel. Your prayer was heard, and I have come because of your prayer. Like the Tanakh, the Bible doesn't use the words guardian angel, but it talks about angels that watch over people and provide them protection and support. Hebrews 1 says that all angels are ministering spirits that serve God's followers. And in Matthew 18, Jesus mentions that children have their own angels in heaven. We see an example of this angel type in Acts 12, when an angel frees the apostle Peter from his chains and leads him safely out of a prison. Just as in the Tanakh in the Bible, the Quran does not actually mention the words guardian angel, but there are some angels who seem to fulfill that function. Gabriel is said to be a protector of Muhammad, and the bearers of the throne are seen to pray for the repentant. In addition, a verse in the 13th chapter mentions attendant angels who are watching over him. This verse is often translated to mean that each person has their own guardian angel. Angels aren't the only spiritual beings acknowledged in these sacred books. In the Tanakh, the Bible, and the Quran, Demons or jinn are also mentioned, and in each holy text, they play the role of adversary. According to Rabbi Ben Sidman, in Jewish tradition, Satan is actually one of the angels of God, one of the members of God's heavenly court, and serves as a kind of prosecutor to challenge people at times, but at the whim and at the will of God, not in opposition to God. Satan works for God and challenges a person because God permits that to happen. In the Christian Bible, demons are adversaries, both of angels and of humans. Regarding angels, Satan is shown in conflict with Michael the Archangel in Revelation and Jude. Regarding humans, in 1 Peter 5 8, the Apostle Peter warns Christians that your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. In the Bible, demons can also oppose humans by afflictions, temptations, or possessions. In the Quran, jinn appears adversaries against both humans and angels. Chapter 7, verse 22 of the Quran says that Iblis, who is the leader of the jinn, was a manifest foe against Adam and Eve. And there are many verses that talk about jinn, and specifically Iblis, trying to tempt humans. 
The Quran also talks about how angels guard heaven against the jinn. There are several verses that describe how angels hurl meteors to keep jinn from approaching heaven. Whether demon or genie, each entity plays a significant role in its respective holy book, as does their connection to idols. There are a few instances in Leviticus 17 and Deuteronomy 32 where non-gods and idols are referred to as demons or goat demons. The term goat demons came about because people used to sacrifice and worship them as if they were God. Biblical references to demons, both in the Old and New Testament, also connect demons to idols. One of the numerous examples is in 1 Corinthians 10. In it, Christians are warned to, quote, flee from idolatry. The Apostle Paul continued and said, things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become partners with demons. Although the Quran does not compare demonic figures to idols as much as the Christian Bible does, the association is still present. An idol is anything that someone worships other than God. The Quran mentions several instances where people worship jinn instead of Allah. One of those instances can be found in chapter 4, verse 76. It says, The believers fight in the way of God, and the unbelievers fight in the idol's way. Fight you, therefore, against friends of Satan. This verse compares idols to the friends of Satan, who are, presumably, jinn. Idols aren't the only things associated with demons. Each sacred text also offers a connection between demons, jinn, and snakes. The snake figure appears multiple times in the Tanakh. The first appearance of this enigmatic figure is in Genesis 3, where it tempts Eve to eat from the tree of life. After this, God cursed the snake. There is a midrash that states this snake was none other than Lilith, the Nine monster. There is also a sea serpent named Leviathan that appears in Isaiah 27 and Psalms 74 as the embodiment of chaos. The Christian Bible also portrays snakes as demonic tempters who oppose God. In Genesis 3, God tells the serpent that the offspring of Eve will bruise his head, and Christians commonly interpret this as a foreshadowing of how Jesus' life would destroy the sin and the death that the devil represents. Likewise, Revelation 12 shows the devil, also known as the serpent, fighting God's heavenly army. In Islamic tradition and culture, it is common to associate jinn with snakes, and this idea is referenced in the Quran. In chapter 27 of the Quran, Allah commands Moses to throw down his staff, and when Moses does, the staff rides like a genie. However, in the 26th chapter of the Quran, this story is repeated, but instead of saying that the staff is like a genie, it says that the staff is a snake. This story shows that, at one point, the word genie may have been used to describe something that was snake-like. In all three holy books, demons are created by God. In all three, demons tempt people. Yet there is disagreement among the religions about the origins of those temptations. Are they acts of rebellion? Or are they actions commanded by God? In Judaism, demons' existence is allowed by God. The idea of a devil reigning over his minions isn't there. In fact, there is no such thing. Instead, the Tanakh talks about a Satan, an adversary who works on God's behalf to test human's faith and loyalty and serves in the heavenly court. This adversary appears multiple times in the Tanakh. One of his most notable appearances occurs in Job 1 and 2 when the adversary makes sure Job loses his animals, attendants, and children, all to test Job's faith before the Lord. The idea of Satan grows substantially in the Christian Bible and under Christian doctrine. He became known as the devil and sometimes as Beelzebul. He is labeled as a prince of demons in Matthew 12 and the father of lies in John 8. Unlike Jews, many Christians believe that Satan acts in conflict with God. Christians commonly interpret passages such as Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and Revelation 12 as descriptions of how Satan was a powerful angel who pridefully rebelled against God, and a third of the other angels followed his lead. For their rebellion, Satan and the other fallen angels were removed from God's favor, and they now tempt and afflict humanity. 
In Islam, there is a race of creatures that, in Western culture, is often thought to be the Islamic version of a Judeo-Christian demon. They are known as jinn, and the king of the evil jinn is called Iblis. The Quran says that Iblis was with the angels when Allah ordered them to bow down to Adam. However, Iblis thought he was superior to Adam, so he refused to bow. Allah cursed him for this, and ever since then, Iblis has led a group of the jinn in an attempt to lead Allah's people astray. Do jinn act out of defiance? Are some demons simply following God's orders? Though the Abrahamic religions differ in their answers to these questions, all three holy books agree that God is more powerful than any demon, jinn, or its leader. There are many instances where the Tanakh states how God is more powerful than demons. Job 1 and 2 show how the adversary is sent by God instead of working for himself as a free entity. Rabbi Ben Sidman tells us there is no force capable of opposing God since he is, quote, the ultimate power in the universe. In the Bible, the New Testament shows Jesus and his followers complete authority over demons. In Matthew 15, all Jesus had to say to heal a demon-possessed girl was, it shall be done for you as you wish, and she was healed at once. Additionally, Matthew 4 shows that the Word of God, also known as the Bible, is powerful over demons. And Revelation 12 describes the defeat of Satan by God's angels. In an interview with Pastor Steve Norman, he shares what Satan's defeat by God's angels in Revelation 12 reveals about God's power. That just spells huge victory. You have nothing to be scared of because it, the devil is not God's equal. Pastor Norman also shares that the idea that Satan only took one third of the angels with him when he fell also shows the superiority of God's army. If the devil has one demon, God has two angels for every demon. And demons and ghosts and spirits, they're outnumbered two to one. Just as in the Tanakh in the Bible, the Quran repeatedly states that Allah, or God, is above demons. In the 16th chapter, it says that Iblis only has power over those who are his followers. And the very second verse of the Quran makes it abundantly clear that Allah is greater than all of his creation. The Quran also speaks about how Allah will condemn the evil jinn, including Iblis, to hell. While the holy book portrayals are foundational to beliefs about angels and demons, they are not the only source of influence for today's believer, however strict or casual. Outside of the holy books, the religions show similarities between sources such as their apocrypha, folklore, and contemporary renderings of angels and demons. In these non-canonical sources, the concept of angels and demons in some ways remains the same, but in other ways, it is expanded with the addition of names, specific appearances, interesting functions, conflicted characters, and even personality. According to Rabbi Alan Lerner, Gabriel means God is my strength. This angel is often depicted in extra-canonical works as an archangel. Sometimes he's even described as the leader of the cherubim. In Jewish mysticism books such as Kabbalah, Gabriel is associated with the color purple and is described as an angel who helps people interpret their dreams. In 2020, Angels Fallen, an action movie, he's a fearless warrior with the task of defeating evil entities. Non-canonical Christian sources also mention Gabriel, who in Apocrypha is identified as one of the seven archangels. In many renderings, he retains the biblical messenger status. In contemporary literature, such as Chuck Black's 2015 book, Rise of the Fallen, Gabriel is the esteemed leader of the messenger order. Sometimes, however, authors take significant liberties with the messenger role. For example, Milton's Paradise Lost describes Gabriel helping Michael fight in a battle, which is something that never happens in the Bible. Islamic tradition changes Gabriel's functions dramatically from how they are shown in the Quran. In the Quran, Gabriel serves almost exclusively as a messenger, but in the Hadith, Gabriel is also the angel responsible for acts of mass destruction, such as the obliteration of the two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. This change is portrayed in some non-canonical sources, but is not usually shown in contemporary works. Another angel who has been reshaped by time and stories is Michael. A prince of life for some, a leader for others. Michael is an advocate for the Jewish people associated with the right side, with kindness, and life-giving water. 
In the book of Kabbalah, he's a warrior who brings glory to God. However, in modern renderings like Ali Samani's 2020 movie, Angels Fallen, and the fifth season of the TV show Lucifer, Michael is rather a tricky or even evil warrior archangel. For example, in one scene, Michael wants to destroy his angelic brothers, Amenadiel and Samuel, over jealousy. God even has to come down to break up the fight. Michael persists in Christian-influenced pop culture. In Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins' 2000 novel, The Indwelling, someone mistakes Michael for Gabriel. Michael distinguishes himself, saying, I prefer righteous warfare to conversation. Gabriel announces, I engage in battle. The 2005 show Supernatural portrays Michael with a twist. In season five, Michael is introduced as the firstborn archangel, whose mission is to lead the heavenly host and defeat his rebellious brother, Lucifer. In later seasons, however, he turns into an antagonist, first of God and then of the Winchester brothers. There are not many Islamic films of the angel Michael, possibly due to the contested belief that depicting angels is a sin. But regardless of his absence in films, Michael is still a prominent character in other extra canonical sources. According to the Hadith, Michael is thought to be the leader of prayers for the heavenly host and, as already mentioned, responsible for natural life. There's also a famous Islamic prayer that references Michael as an angel of mercy that was created for showing Allah's kindness. Guardian angels are very prominent in Jewish traditions. Dr. Ellen Umansky defines them as bringers of wisdom, compassion, strength, and love as a reminder of the divine presence. In medieval Jewish mysticism, some angels like Sanoi, Sensoi, and Samangalov were believed to protect newborns from Lilith. Finally, many Jews believe angels can adopt other forms like energies who try to prevent people from doing something or as humans blessing others' individuals' lives. Guardian angels remain prevalent in Christian culture. For example, they are in Mexican folk prayers, such as Angel de la Guarda, which means guardian angel. We also see them in movies like It's a Wonderful Life, where George Bailey's guardian angel stops him from committing suicide and shows him that life is worth living. Also, many people record that their guardian angels came to them in their time of need, like when they were lost, in the hospital, or in a car accident. Guardian angels do not change much between the Quran and extra-canonical sources, and they are not often portrayed in modern renderings. But while extra-canonical sources do not add much to guardian angels, they do mention the recording angels. These angels rest on every person, and the angel on the right records the good deeds of the person, while the angel on the left records the evil deeds. While these are not necessarily considered guardian angels, they share a similar relationship with humans that guardian angels do. These religious traditions assert that there are angels who protect us in life, and they also hold that there is one angel whose job it is to escort us to the next realm, and that angel is the angel of death. Rabbi Louis Warchauer says some people believe this being is the one who appeared to Abraham and prevent him from killing his son. However, there are not many other instances where this heavenly being appears as a benevolent one. This famous angel appears in the Passover song Haggadia, where it says God will destroy the angel of death. In the Talmud, he appears as an angel with many eyes. No one can escape his sight. In season three of the TV show Lucifer, he appears as a ghost whose real name is Azrael, whose task is to guide the souls of the dead. The angel of death is also a nickname assigned to Joseph Mengele, the infamous Nazi physician known for his horrifying experiment at Auschwitz. In Christian folk tales, the angel of death evolved into a character we all know, the Grim Reaper. This famous character is all over folklore. For example, a Mexican version of this Grim Reaper is a folk saint named Santa Muerte. Other renderings of the angel of death are found in shows like Touched by an Angel, where the angel of death appears as an angelic caseworker who escorts people to the afterlife. In the episode Flights of Angels, the angel tells a dying man that God sent him to, quote, help you finish your work and then bring you home. Azrael, the angel of death, is a very important part of the extra canonical works of Islam, and he appears relatively often in modern renderings. In extra canonical works, Azrael is often thought to be enormous so that he can gather people's souls. He has millions of eyes and is often thought to appear differently to Muslims and to non-Muslims. 
A common theme of stories with Israel is that death is unavoidable. And this theme is often demonstrated in such stories as the tale of Solomon and the Angel of Death. But angels are not the only supernatural beings that transcend their holy texts. Demons also make an appearance in folklore, literature, and popular culture. Just as in their respective holy books, they are prominently seen as adversaries. According to Rabbi Sidman, demons were created for divine purposes. For instance, medieval sources reveal Samuel, the head of Satan, as the persecutor of the people of Israel. Also, there is a midrash indicating he was the one persuading Abraham to doubt his faith in God. Nowadays, the concept of Satan as an adversary appears in TV shows like Lucifer, in which the main character is an evil angel whose role consists of bringing to light people's biggest desires and providing them when easy ways out and away from God. Christians also consider demons to be adversaries. In Norse texts, which Christianity influenced, demonic figures like Loki work against benevolent beings like Thor to bring chaos and darkness into the world. In other sources, demons are adversaries to humans. In Pilgrim's Progress, Beelzebub runs a vanity fair, which is designed to use worldly possessions to distract God's pilgrims from the celestial city. From Christian exorcists, we hear that demons also attack humans by possessing them, making them act crazed and violent. The jinn are frequently shown to be terrible enemies to humans, and this can be demonstrated best by taking a look at some modern horror movies. In the 1997 horror movie, Wishmaster, a genie tortures people by granting their wishes in a way that hurts or kills them. In the French movie, Stranded, or Jinns, the jinn kill almost an entire squad of soldiers. The Turkish, Haunted, shows the jinn continually molesting a woman, and in the 2014 movie, Jinn, a group of the beings try to erase an entire family line. Demons and jinn both play the role of adversary to humans, angels, and God. But that's not the only thing they have in common. They also share an intriguing quality, the ability to shapeshift. In Jewish traditions, shapeshifting is a particular characteristic of demons, especially Lilith. Medieval and ancient sources depict Lilith as a seducer who could turn into a vampire or a snake. Other sources, such as the Midrash, talk about demons as shapeless creatures that manifest and thrive within the vacuum. Christian legends also describe shapeshifters. For example, the werewolf is a demonic figure of European folklore that can shapeshift between human and wolf form, especially during a full moon. The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis also mention shapeshifting. In it, the powerful mentor demon named Screwtape turns into a large centipede. One of the most common themes that are portrayed about the jinn is their ability to shapeshift. Some Muslims believe that they cannot appear to humans, but others argue that they can if they shapeshift out of their original form. The jinn's ability to shapeshift is often portrayed in modern renderings. Movies such as Wishmaster, Haunted, and Jinn, and books such as Fireboy, The Forbidden Wish, and the Children of the Lamp series all show jinn shapeshifting into animals, humans, or some demonic form. Perhaps the most noteworthy of the shapeshifters is the female demon known as Lilith. Lilith, the first woman of Adam, the snake in the Garden of Eden, the baby killer, the seducer. To some, she's a vampire, to others, she's a symbol of the feminist movement. The Jewish legend said she was condemned because she refused to be less than Adam. This prominent character appears in several sources, from the alphabet of Ben Sira, Tethelmud, and Kabbalah to new renderings such as the book of essays on feminism, Judaism, and sexual ethics by Judith Plasco and novels by Angela Carter and Toni Morrison. Lilith made her way into Christian renderings also. In the show Supernatural, she is the first demon created by Lucifer's twisting of a human soul. She possesses little girls and frees Lucifer from his imprisonment. In C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there is a character named the White Witch. She is the villainous ruler of Narnia, who puts the land under a perpetual winter. Interestingly, she is a descendant of none other than Lilith. Unlike Jews and Christians, most Muslims do not believe in the existence of Lilith. She was not included in the Quran or in the Hadith, and as a result, she was not mentioned in many contemporary Islamic renderings. However, 
There are some Islamic traditions outside of the Quran and Hadith that have an Islamic version of Lilith. Her name is Karina, which is also the Islamic term for a succubus. And just like the Jewish and Christian Lilith, the Islamic Karina is known for making women infertile and for sleeping with unconscious men. Succubus and incubus are the names assigned to the female and male demons who seduce and have intercourse with men and women in their sleep. In the Book of Sohar, Lilith is described as a beautiful woman who goes to every place where a man sleeps, attaches herself to him, and births children for him. Ashmerai, the prince of hell, is known to be a famous incubus, and there are many stories from women that claim a demon visited them in their sleep and raped them. Another seducer is an Irish goddess named the Morrigan, who can appear as a hag, woman, or crow. When she appears as a woman, she tries to lure heroes and deities with her flawless beauty. A more recent example is found in an X-Files episode titled Avatar. In it, one of the characters spends the night with a prostitute. As he is slumbering, he dreams that he is sleeping with an old woman. He wakes up, and to his dismay, he finds the prostitute dead beside him. As the episode progresses, people begin to worry that the old woman he saw is a succubus who is killing women that rouse her jealousy. Jinn who sleep with humans are a common theme in literature and movies. The Islamic term for a female jinn who sleeps with unconscious men is a karina. They do not appear much in extra canonical works or in contemporary renderings, with very few exceptions. By contrast, 1001 Nights has several stories of male jinn who kidnap women and repeatedly abuse them. And there are many modern renderings, such as the movie Haunted, that show jinn sleeping with women by deception or force. Another type of seducer is the kind that rests on the shoulder, the tempter who tries to lead humans astray. The belief that every human has a personal demon on their shoulder is a belief that flourishes with folklore and traditions. For instance, the sages say that he who commits one transgression acquires himself one angel accuser, whereas sermons delivered in Jewish communities state that all individuals have an evil angel or a satan on their shoulder who tells them what they want to do, rather what they should do. Personal demons are also in Christian sources. For example, folkloric beliefs hold that when someone spills salt, they should throw some of it over their left shoulder because it symbolizes the preservation of holiness and will ward off the demon that sits there. In Disney's movie, The Emperor's New Groove, Kronk's shoulder demon comically tries to keep him from listening to his shoulder angel. He's trying to lead you down the path of righteousness. I'm gonna lead you down the path that rocks. In Islam, there's a type of jinn, a tempter known as a kareen. It accompanies every person, and they appear in both the Quran and in the Hadith. In one of the stories in the Hadith, someone asks the Prophet Muhammad if he has a kareen. The Prophet replies that he does, but it became a Muslim and now only entices him to do good. This indicates that the Kareen have the choice to do good or evil, and that they can also choose how they influence humans. An interesting element that appears in these religions' traditions, or the pop culture influenced by them, is the depiction of animals as dark entities, in particular, dogs and snakes. The Tanakh doesn't talk about demons appearing as dogs. However, ancient Jewish tradition does. There is a Lorraine Kabbalah story by Rabbi Joseph de la Reina, where Samuel and Lilith appear as two large black dogs to portray their true nature. Within Christian tradition, demon dogs are prevalent, especially in British and South American traditions. Whether they are known as a hellhound, phantom dog, or el cadejo, they are often much larger than a normal dog, and they have glowing eyes or even hooves or a chain. For example, the Omen horror movies have hellhounds. They are assistants to either Satan or the Antichrist, and they often appear in violent death scenes. In Islam, there are many different views on the nature of dogs. In one hadith, Muhammad is reported to have said that the black dog is a devil. And in another, Muhammad orders the death of all dogs, but later switches the death sentence to only black dogs with two spots. Some claim that these hadith are not genuine because the Quran generally shows dogs in a positive light. Really, regardless of whether they are genuine or not, these hadith still portray the idea of an Islamic demon dog. 
The snake in Jewish traditions is usually a reference to the story of the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. For instance, the first century CE Jewish pseudepigraphic text, Slavic Baruch Bishon, mentions Samel as the snake tempted Eve. There is also Midrash that said it was Lilith, not Samael, who appeared as the snake to persuade Eve to eat from the tree. Though they disagree about who the snake was, they both used the snake to highlight the existence of temptation. The Silver Chair by C.S. Lewis offers a Christian example of this association between demonic figures and snakes. It describes the transformation of an evil witch queen of the Underland. As she transforms from a human into a terrifying snake, she loses her arms, intertwines her legs, and changes her green dress into a tail. There's also a kid's superhero show called Teen Titans Go, where the heroes are at a slumber party and they accidentally summon a demon named Scary Terry who can shapeshift into a snake. The association between jinn and snakes is very prominent in non-canonical Islamic works. The 1001 Nights in particular has several stories where this association is shown. In one of those stories, a woman sees a serpent chasing a snake. She has compassion on the snake and kills the serpent, and it turns out that both of them were jinn. There are many other good examples of this association, such as a hadith about killing certain snakes because they are evil jinn. An important side note to make is that in Jewish, Christian, and Islamic traditions, snakes can also have positive associations when they are compared to a neutral or good being. However, Snakes are compared to evil beings far more often than they are compared to good ones. Regardless of the shape these demons take, Jewish, Christian, and Islamic traditions, as well as modern depictions, make one thing clear. God is more powerful than demons. As in the Tanakh, Jewish traditions have several demon depictions that show how God is more powerful. For instance, the laying of Lilith ascending to the skies reflects how she could not defy the war of God when he commanded that she returned. Instead, by her disobedience, she was expelled from heaven and thrown into the Red Sea, where she is supposed to roar until the end of time. Also, many exorcisms conducted by rabbis show how scripture is very effective in expelling a demon out of somebody. Christians also recognize God's authority over Satan and his demons. For example, exorcism rituals often include the Bible, Jesus' name, or prayer. Literature also reflects this belief. In The Door in the Dragon's Throat by Frank Peretti, when a boy uses the name of Jesus, he causes demons to scream, cower, and give up their attack. Sources outside the Quran also demonstrate the idea that Allah is greater than jinn. This concept is shown by the many people, including Islamic exorcists, who recite the Quran, Allah's words, to stop jinn from causing harm. This concept is often portrayed in modern renderings, such as the movie Jinn. Jinn shows us when a character asks God to protect him from a genie, and when another character says that jinn cannot enter a house of God. From holy texts and folklore to contemporary literature and Hollywood movies, Angels and demons abound, and their depictions as protectors or foes reveal much about human nature. One such revelation is a desire to connect to the supernatural. Judaism has shown that this desire is aimed at God. Human beings manifest this desire through praying, through believing and following God's word, and through devotion. This desire to be close to the divine has evolved differently throughout history. It has led people to turn to third card and oracles, to create a golem, and to seek knowledge in mystical writings and art. Some efforts to connect with the supernatural may seem drastic and even dangerous, but the one thing they have in common is that they all seek to reach that which is beyond our physical understanding. Christians also desire this connection to the supernatural. Many people want to contact angels so that they will have a closer relationship with God. Because Christians believe that we cannot see God the Father, some consider angels to be their only opportunity for physical interaction with God's spiritual kingdom. Some believers, especially followers of Catholicism, also believe that this intermediary status of angels means that if we pray to God through the angels, our prayers get special graces. Less commonly, there is also a desire to connect to the darker side of the spiritual realm. Some people will try to contact evil spirits 
through forms of occultism, like Ouija boards or summoning games like Bloody Mary. There is an Islamic belief that angels pray for forgiveness and mercy for a lost people. This belief might demonstrate that, number one, humans desire a closer relationship to God, and number two, that they want extra help in achieving this goal. The sheer number of movies, books, and songs about angels and jinn is more than enough evidence to support this idea. In a world where people see examples of evil almost everywhere, it makes sense that humans seek protection and security from evil itself. The existence of exorcisms, prayers, spells, amulets and bowls demonstrate that people seek to attach themselves to what brings them hope and that feeling of sanctuary. Christian renderings also reflect this desire for security. Christians take comfort in knowing that God will help them in their times of need when no one else can. Roy Godwin, a man who claims to have seen an angel during a severe car accident, explains why angels are meaningful to him. It seems to me as though God sent an angel to help me. I knew I wasn't abandoned. I knew I wasn't on my own. I was clear that God was going to carry me through where I was. And I felt loved. Christians take comfort in knowing that angels are watching over them and can protect them against tragedy and evil forces. Islamic beliefs also demonstrate a basic human desire for security. Perhaps two of the beliefs that demonstrate this the most is the belief in guardian angels and the belief of the supremacy of Allah. All three religions have angels who constantly watch over and protect people. While there are not many Islamic stories about these angels, the belief itself demonstrates that people like to think that someone is watching their back. Muslims also demonstrate a desire for security with their belief that Allah, a good and gracious God, is in control of everything and that he will help and bless them. Some stories about these supernatural beings also reveal a human desire to be unique or special in the universe. They depict humans as having a higher status than angels and demons. For instance, the 14th century Catalonian Passover Haggada tells the story of the angels bowing before Adam on the day of mankind's creation, which shows human superiority over angels. Modern representations of this desire for uniqueness are shown in several TV shows and movies where angels and demons seek human companionship or even want to become one, like Azrael and Amenariel and Lucifer. After all, humans are the only beings with free will. Christian sources also reflect a desire to be special in the universe. In the Bible, Christians can find assurance that God holds humans in special regard. Hebrews 1 and 2 as well as 1 Corinthians 6, helps establish our status. They say that Jesus died to save humans, not the angels. And angels are ordered to serve us. And while angels may be more knowledgeable or powerful than us, the Bible says that one day we will judge the angels. Popular Christian culture also reflects the idea that humans wish to be special. There are countless examples of shows and movies that describe angels who desire human relationships especially romantic ones. For instance, in the movie City of Angels, an angel chooses to fall so that he can be with a human woman. Tragically, he gets to spend only one night with her, but afterwards, he says that that single night was worth more to him than an eternity as an angel. All humans, regardless of race or religion, desire to be special. This desire is often revealed in stories that portray humans as an envied or superior race. A good example is the story of the creation of Adam. According to the Quran, Allah ordered the angels, beings who are certainly more powerful than humans, to bow down to the newly created Adam. Another example would be the many stories about angels or jinn wanting to be human, such as the genie in Disney's Aladdin, or desiring the love of humans, such as the books The Archangel and Becoming Jinn. Though we may desire to be unique in the universe, we do not want to feel alone. To that end, writers across the ages have created characters and stories that attempt to humanize the supernatural. Pop culture definitely has some Judeo-Christian influences. The way angels and demons are sometimes portrayed reveals a human desire to find human imperfections in supernatural beings. For example, a Jewish tradition shows angels as perfect beings who cannot fall in love. However, people like to use angels in songs and stories to talk about the idea of being in love or to describe a lover. 
As for demons, they're often used in stories and in real life to describe humans' shadowy states of mind, a dark secret, or even a dark past. Christians also like exploring the idea that spiritual beings are flawed, just like us. Besides the Christian idea that angels can fall and become demons, many Christian movies and films show that even the good angels make mistakes. For example, Jonathan from Highway to Heaven, one of the most iconic kind-hearted angels of television, openly rebelled against God in one episode. The idea that people like to humanize powerful supernatural beings is certainly present in Islamic culture. Islamic angels are not often portrayed as imperfect, but jinn are often portrayed very similarly to humans. In terms of possessing free will, jinn are already similar to humans, but modern renderings blur the lines even more. In the TV show Jinn, both the good and evil jinn act like petty teenagers, and in the show I Dream of Genie, the being named Genie acts like nothing more than a funny and somewhat foolish human. Something else that is reflected in these stories about supernatural beings is a desire to understand the world, in particular, why bad things happen. In antiquity and during the times the Midrash was written, it was believed that it was Lilith who caused the mysterious death of newborns. Later, it was discovered that it was SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome that caused these deaths. Nowadays, some people still think malevolent spirits are behind diseases, mental disorders, and even natural disasters. Though humans have a hard time figuring out why evil exists, U.S. tradition offers an answer to this. Evil exists simply because God allows it to exist. Free will wouldn't have any value without humans having the opportunity to discover all the choices there are. Christian narratives also reflect the struggle to explain evil. Demons and Satan seem to help people come to term with the bad things that happen. For example, many Christians think of Satan as the source of all evil, even though the Bible and Christian religious leaders commonly reject that idea. Other examples include people blaming afflictions, like headaches or sleep paralysis, on demons. People often blame the supernatural for the evil in the world. Muslims believe that Allah is the original creator of good and evil, that humans can bring evil upon themselves, and that jinn can bring evil to humans, like mental illnesses, cancer, or infertility. It is often difficult to tell why some evil event occurred. Was it due to a human sin, a jinn attack, or a test from Allah? When the cause of a devastating event is difficult to discover, people, regardless of religion, often blame the invisible. Perhaps one of the most powerful desires reflected in these stories, whether ancient or contemporary, is a desire for justice. Several passages in the Tanakh show humans' appreciation for justice. For instance, Moses liberated the Israelites from the Egyptians and God punished wicked behaviors with plagues and floods. The TV show Lucifer, which is partially influenced by Jewish traditions, also demonstrates this appreciation for justice. In it, humans get satisfaction for putting the bad guys in jail, and angels, including the main character, have a role in supporting that justice. From the Bible to modern renderings, Christian stories also reflect a desire for justice and for the forces of light to win over the forces of darkness. Whether it's a story about God and the angels defeating Satan, like in the Bible or Paradise Lost, Christians defeating Napoleon, like in Pilgrim's Progress, or even Thor defeating Loki in the Marvel movies, we are comforted by the idea that good will ultimately overcome evil. Throughout many Islamic sources, there is a persistent theme of justice. This is seen in the belief that Allah judges wicked humans, in the belief that the tempting jinn will be thrown into hell, in the belief that good people will be rewarded for the good they have done. Humans intrinsically desire the good side of the universe to win. Though there are exceptions, the general rule in movies, books, and stories is that the good guys might be defeated for a time, but they will always come back for the win. Angels that protect us and fall in love with us. Demons and jinn who try to lead us astray. Tales of these supernatural beings may be found in ancient texts and sacred books, but also in legends and lullabies and movies. Are their stories simply our attempt at understanding the supernatural? Or by telling and adding to their stories, are we simply trying to better understand?
ourselves.